This is the Vegas Huddle with Mike Davis. What's up, guys? Mike Davis here inside the den for the Vegas Huddle. We got another great episode for you today. A guy who, I mean, this is a big guy, okay? Played offensive <laughs> tackle in the NFL with the Detroit Lions, but he's also a local guy, went to Green Valley High School, and he's got a great career now here, giving back to the community through insurance, but we're going to be learning all about his career, his rise. He even played at Oregon. He played basketball in high school, too, so there's so much great stuff to talk about. We got in the house, in the den with us right now, the great Tyrell Crosby. Tyrell, <laughs> thanks so much for being with us. How does it feel to be back home in, in your hood of a <laughs> Green Valley? It's awesome. I mean, I grew up here, spent majority of my life out here, so love being back so very much. So you were born in Utah, but you actually went to Green Valley High School. Yep. And so how, how old were you when you, you came to town? So yeah, I mean, born in Bountiful, Utah, which is a small town just north of Salt Lake, and then moved out here when I was about six. So started first grade, went to Jim Thorpe Elementary, went to uh, Treme Elementary, Thurman White, which all in this area. Wow, it's pretty cool. And you know, it, I think it's a very full circle thing, but let's let's really start with when you start growing into this body. Because mm. I mean, being an <laughs> offensive tackle in the NFL, that's a totally different thing. We see mm. these running backs, these wide receivers, you know, QBs even, there's a, a lot of different stuff. But when it comes to offensive line in the NFL, this yeah. is a whole different type of body. At what point <laughs> do you grow into an offensive lineman with NFL capabilities? Yeah, I mean, since I was a kid, first started playing football about eight, always was stuck on the O line or D line. I was always a lineman growing up. So kind of just realized that's who I'm going to be as an O lineman or more specifically a lineman. Um, and it wasn't really until college where I was like, I have an opportunity to actually go play in the NFL. Really? Um, even once I got there after our first week of like our mini uh, training camp as a rookie, I still was like, how am I here right now? Because I felt like I didn't belong um, just because I was surrounded by so much talent and it was such an awesome experience for me. So before we get into Oregon, because, I mean, obviously mm -hmm. when, you know, you're playing at Oregon, not only were you all Pac-12 first <laughs> team and, yeah. you know, but in, in high school you kind of had a good, you know, support system of mm -hmm. kind of learning the game because not only did you play offense, you also played defense. I think you had about seven sacks <laughs> yep. defensively. You also played basketball. Mm -hmm. So you were doing a little bit of everything, and you actually you were, like, even averaging, like, 16 boards a game <laughs> on the basketball court. So, yep. I mean, all those things carried over, I'm assuming, to the field, but still mm – -hmm. From what I read, it seemed like you were like maybe one of the top two prospects coming out of Nevada at that time, right? So yeah. you didn't feel like you had the pedigree to become a, a bona fide NFL lineman? Not really. I mean, because for me, when I get out on the field, I'm just telling myself I'm only out here because the coaches trust me. And so that's like my motivation. It's not like, oh, I belong out here. It's like, all right, the coaches have me out here. I need to just trust myself, trust that they have me out there for a reason. So I never thought, like, I was better than anyone. I just went in with this mindset of I'm just going to go out there, do my job, that the coaches trust me to go do. And why did you choose Oregon? Why, why Oregon? Yeah, Oregon, um, well, I was being recruited by, their, by them. Um, they were going through that transition period. Chip Kelly leaving to the NFL, brand-new coach who was a prior OC. Mark Helfrich takes over the job. And I was very on the fence of, do I still want to go there? Um, because – Everything Oregon prior to that was Chip Kelly's, like, pedigree, like, everything that he kind of transformed um, through Oregon and college football was now gone. So I was very much on the fence, and then finally I had the opportunity to go out there my junior year in high school, see the facility being built because it wasn't ready yet, uh, met the staff, loved the staff, was around Eugene, and realized that this is a great place for me to go and develop as a person and on the field. So once I kind of got out there, I realized this is where I want to make my home for the next four years and uh, committed my junior year. And what was it like going on that recruiting trip and having, you know, <laughs> Nike out there? I mean, it must just be the <laughs> swag alone, right? Just the gear. It's, How much gear do they give you when you show up as a recruit? Like, um, Technically, as a recruit, not that much, or I should say none. <laughs> but um, when you get there, you are welcomed with, so much Nike gear. It feels like Christmas. It's first day of training camp. You go to your locker. 
There's like three new pairs of t uh, of sneakers, a bunch of t-shirts, shorts, everything you could ever need. They just provide you. It's amazing. I yeah. mean, I the swag alone would just be it's, an awesome thing. Now, yeah. did you worry? I mean, for because as an O lineman, explain mm -hmm. this to me. When you go to a program like Oregon, where there is, you know, Chip Kelly instituted all the stuff with Mariota, and he's yeah. running around and doing a bunch of stuff, where you know we see it more frequently in uh, in the pros and in college now. But back then, it wasn't as prevalent as mm -hmm. it is today. So. As an offensive lineman, when you have a mobile QB, it actually makes it a little more difficult on you because, <laughs> you know, there's more, you know, I guess upside to maybe get convert that new set of downs. But yeah. it's also hard scheming. So, I mean, was that a challenge, something that worried you rather than being a traditional offense? So, yeah, my my freshman year at Oregon was Marcus's Heisman year. Um and I kind of got thrown into the fire there. Um, and you were playing? Yeah, so our right tackle, Andre Y, can't pronounce his last name. I don't think anybody can. <laughs> but um, he ended up breaking his leg versus Michigan State, um, I think right after the second half started. And so I was like, get in there. My coach pretty much was like, we, you're our only guy. So threw me in there. Um, I was going against Shalik. Or sh he was a top D end of that year. Um, and I was nervous. And then throughout the game, realizing Marcus has the mobility that he has, I'm like, honestly just relax understand the defense feel like where he's trying to lean and use that to kind of gauge where marcus is if i feel him playing more outside of me i know marcus is about to run around me so kind of lean a little more outside gotcha. and having that ability throughout like my freshman year of understanding how to rate a d end to let me know where the quarterback is in relationship to me was huge because then later on we had justin herbert my last two years and he's He's pretty athletic. People don't realize how athletic he is. And so I was already very comfortable uh, having, like, a mobile quarterback behind me. So my last two years at Oregon just felt so comfortable. So you're so that first season, you get thrown right into the fire as a yeah. freshman. Mariota has his Heisman year. Mm -hmm. And when he's having a Heisman-level season, I mean, what is the temperature around the program, the room? I mean, is it – is there – do people – feed into that or is it just like eh, it's just like another thing happening um marcus was unique because he's so humble so quiet and just he's not like branding himself out there so whenever he would walk by us we're just like treating him like a normal person even though he's out here on his heisman campaign just dominating pac-12 defenses and just defenses in general so it was interesting being an old lineman a part of that just because it's like i was a freshman at that time and I was one of the youngest guys on – well, I was the youngest guy on the, our starting O-line. Yeah. So I'm just like, guys, Marcus Mariota just walked by us. Like, you guys aren't going to just, like, get super excited? And so I had to bottle that all in because it was just for Really? Me. Yeah. You're saying you felt that way, what, like at the <laughs> dining room? Like Just all the time. Uh, really? For the, at least for the first, like, month and a half because I was just so new and right. he was such a predominant figure in that organization or well, team where I would just be like – this is so freaking cool. I have the opportunity to block for a guy who's possibly going to win the Heisman and then go on to win the Heisman. Yeah. Um, it was awesome. It was truly awesome. Before we get into more of the Herbert stuff, because I know you said you have a good Herbert story, <laughs> like, yes. does it surprise you? You know, you spent, you know, three seasons with the Lions or mm -hmm. something. You know, when our Mariota wins a Heisman yeah. and has that level of ability in college and then you know, kind of doesn't develop the way that we thought he would probably mm -hmm. in the NFL and doesn't maybe reach the potential that was uh, maybe suited for him in terms of the media yeah. and all that kind of stuff. What, what do you, how do you look at that? Why does a player like that who has that much promise and ability and succeeds with that Heisman level ability, mm -hmm. why does it not always translate to the NFL? Um, I don't think people give NFL players the credit they deserve of just how good they are. Um, it's truly, it's truly impressive. I'd be out there some days and just question how I'm playing the same sport as some of these guys. Um, so that transition for him didn't help where he went originally. Um, as an offensive lineman, I loved watching Marcus uh, while I was still at Oregon, and I know O line play enough where I knew his offensive line wasn't the best. So. To kind of get thrusted in there and put so much pressure on 
but a team doesn't build around you definitely can hinder your, right. your growth as an NFL quarterback. So you think a lot of it is just situation. You yeah. know, he goes to Tennessee or something, and, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of talk even because of Kelly mm-hmm. being the coach of the, the Philadelphia Eagles yep. and maybe wanting to snag Mariota and make that a marriage. But you think maybe just going to Tennessee and having that situation yep. goes somewhere else, it could have been a totally different story. Exactly, and I think one of the best examples of that today is Geno Smith. You get thrown in a good situation as a quarterback, you're bound to succeed. Um, and Geno Smith was a guy similar to Marcus, had a lot of praise coming out of college, and then kind of just dropped off and stayed under the radar. And then last year when he got to Seattle, just exploded and just had one of the best years as a, like a Seattle quarterback. Yeah, it's really fascinating how much that comes to play. And and when it comes to Herbert, uh, yeah. so you played two seasons, you, you said, with him. Yep. What was he like just as a leader and a person? <laughs> As a leader, he was always very quiet. Um, he's a very much a much of me introvert. Um, doesn't like to get in front of the team, start yelling, um, but has no problem coming next to you and just kind of giving you the motivation that you need. And he's someone who truly does lead by example. I mean, every time I was around him, he was working his tail off. Uh, whether it's the weight room, out on the field, in the school, he was just. You could tell he was giving it his all. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And what is this story you have? I hear you have a great story. <laughs> yeah. So earlier how we were talking about basketball, um, anybody who's played basketball decently enough at a high enough level or like in high school, honestly, um, has been dunked on. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're playing intramural basketball. And like I said prior, like Justin Herbert is a freak athlete. People do not give him the credit really? that he deserves. And that was the first person who truly dunked on me. And I just had to accept it. There was nothing I could do. Wait, hold on. So you're playing intramural <laughs> basketball at Oregon. Yeah. You're playing around, and he what, – what's the situation? I mean, p- give me the play-by-play of this. Oh, I was in the post where I belong, just trying <laughs> to be at my center self. Um, and all of a sudden, I see this six six dude just running full speed at me, and I'm like, oh, should I move? Like, Justin's – he's big. Um, I was like, do I move or do I just try to block him? I'm like, I'm going to try to block him which that's where I made the mistake. I should have moved because he came up and dunked on me. And he <laughs> and, just, I mean, what? Yeah. He just came up oh, like that, boom. One hand just completely over me. Like, it was absurd. I could not stop he him if I wanted. He has that many hops, yes. that much hops. And he, how tall? You're 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, yeah, so Justin's like about an inch taller, so he's a solid 6'6". Six, six. And that was the first time someone went up where it's like I couldn't meet them in the air. Like, he was every possible athletic bone in my body was not close to his and he finished yeah oh yeah it was impressive <laughs> and it's one of the moments where i was like that happened i can't do anything about it he's he's a freak athlete that's pretty cool <laughs> and um so someone like him i mean if we're comparing and contrasting mm-hmm. you know why is he you know finding a little bit more success you think at that nfl level what is it about his makeup or just his is it the build with mm-hmm. the intellect, what, where is it at? Because it's fascinating. As a quarterback, you said he's a little bit more shy and not as yeah. outspoken. So mm-hmm. I guess QBs come in all different kind of <laughs> shapes and sizes. But what is it about him that you think has made him you know, such a, an impactful figure at the next level? Yeah, one thing he does not shy away from is if he's mad at you, he'll let you know. And if you're like a wide receiver dropping the ball, offensive lineman not picking up the, your responsibilities, uh, running back just – reading the holes wrong, he'll come over and he won't like do it in front of the team, but he'll let you know how passionate he is that he wants you to fix whatever's wrong. Um, and that's something I have a lot of respect for um, just because he has a way to hold you accountable that really makes you like <laughs> hold yourself accountable. Yeah. And it's awesome to be around. It sucks to be the person getting yelled at by him because uh, you can just tell how angry he is, but he means it in the best of ways and it's because he knows how good he can be. Where Marcus, he's very like mellow, relaxed, and he'll like kind of yell a little bit, but it's just a little bit different. And for me, at least, I responded better to Herbert's way of like holding guys accountable. Um, and it really made me want to better myself as a player because like I know everything that Justin's doing in the background that most people don't understand. I need to hold myself to that same standard and just be the best football player that I can be to make sure he's safe. That's cool. And then so you end up getting drafted 2018 yep. NFL draft, round five pick 
153. Now, this is the same draft. I think, you know, Baker went first overall, yep. Saquon, you know, um, a lot of that stuff. But that year, so the, the Lions take at 20, your future center that you work with, your mm-hmm. peer, Frank <laughs> Rag now. Yep. And, um, and then you're drafted in the fifth round. And, you know, it's an interesting time in Detroit because – Matt Patricia is the head coach. <laughs> so let's just start without me even insinuating anything. <laughs> let's just get into what it's like. So you're, you know, mm-hmm. obviously born in Utah. You're playing at Green Valley. You're playing, you know, football. You're playing basketball. Mm-hmm. You're, you know, widely recruited. I'm assuming you're one of the top prospects. I think you had a, a lot of pancake blocks. <laughs> that was your forte. Yeah. Uh, syrup on the side. Um, but. You get drafted and you go to Detroit. What's the temperature when you arrive in Detroit? How, I mean, first of all, take me to getting drafted. What was that moment like for you? Where were you? So I was at one of my best friend's house. He lives down the road from the studio. (laughs) (laughs) Just because I wanted to be somewhere just kind of calm and relaxed. Yeah. And I'm doing the whole draft process. And going into the draft, I was top five offensive tackle. Um, So I was like, all right. Day one or two, maybe. I don't know. Top five. and Your top five. Like tackle in the like, entire draft and the prospects, yeah. Wow. Uh, for most people, I was rated at the top. top wow. Five. So I was like, all right, I should go like latest day two, and so after day one passes, I'm like, all right, I, I knew I wasn't gonna go day one, and then day two passes, and I'm just like, what's what's going on, guys? So, um, talking to my agent, and he's just as confused as I am, and then finally I get my phone call and I see a three one three number. And immediately, I think eight mile, because gotcha. Eminem always talks about the three one three. It's like, oh, I'm about to get drafted by Detroit. So pick up the number, uh, pick up my phone, and it's Martha Ford talking to me, and it's her saying, "Hey, we are selecting you with this pick in the draft. We are so excited to have you." Uh, she put me on the phone with uh, Patricia, and he's just was like super excited, and a couple minutes later, you see my name on the TV, and it's just a, such a surreal moment of wow, like, even if I wanted to dream of this moment, I couldn't accurately, de- like, depict it. And it was truly a special moment. It's so special. Mm-hmm. And um, so you weren't, you were grateful. It wasn't mm-hmm. as much, you weren't thinking, why didn't I go earlier? You're thinking yeah. just more, I'm happy. Yeah, I was just, honestly, day one and two didn't matter to me at that point. Is I'm just having the privilege to be drafted, which is something so few football players get to actually, op- like, have that opportunity. So leading up to it, it was like a lot of frustration. And once it happens, all that frustration's out the window. You just are overwhelmed with a grateful feeling. And when you're w- talking with your agent, who was your agent at the time? Yeah, so uh, my agent, his name's Steve Carrick. He's based out of Vegas. Uh, his office is over in uh, Town Square. So oh. for me, it was like perfect because he, he has a bunch of big, big-time guys. Like uh, Zach Ertz is one of them. Oh, okay. So when, so when you're talking with him and you're thinking you're going one or two, what ha- like, do you ever get an answer on why that is or – um, you kind of get a little bit of a brief answer, but oftentimes they are just as clueless as you, not in any like bad way. It's just because everything is just happening so fast. They don't really have the opportunity to get answers from teams. Yeah. So it was just kind of like let time happen, see where I go type of moment. And I was very grateful to end up in Detroit. And when you get to Detroit, tell me about what that's like. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of like you go to Oregon and you got to mm-hmm. learn the whole process and learn that <laughs> level of football. And now you're yeah. like, man, I'm a professional football player. What's, mm-hmm. you know, do you have butterflies? Are you excited? Like, what's, what does it feel like when you actually arrive that first day? And I'm like, yeah. wow, I'm a professional football player. Uh, so, yeah, I had Patricia my first few years at the Lions. And for those who don't know, it comes from the Patriots system. Right. So I got introduced to the Patriots system very quickly, um, and I understand why many guys don't enjoy it. Um, and, yeah, explain that. Why Why don't – even though he was – so here is the, the knock on Patricia, and still mm-hmm. the continuous knock, is that he was really, you know, a defensive side of the football guy, as mm-hmm. Belichick has always been. Yeah. And, you know, he's had these stints, like last season with the Patriots, where he's trying to be an offensive <laughs> coordinator, and he really can't succeed at that. And now he's like a defensive specialist yeah. kind of coach with the Eagles. But, you know, he's implementing Patriot philosophy on both sides of the football once mm-hmm. he arrives as a head coach? Yeah, so the Patriots system, I mean, it's worked for the Patriots, but it is – they have everything set up to do that. Um, whereas for us, it was just – 
<laughs> the best way to kind of put it is not necessarily waste our time, but make us be as rookies in the facility for as much time as possible so we don't make mistakes. Like, we don't get in trouble outside the facility. Yeah. So there would be days where we'd have to go in at 5.30 in the morning because we had to work on our rookie skit, even though it was just us sitting in the room pretty much just doing nothing. Or, like, we'd have to go help the uh, EQ guys with um, putting away laundry and things like that. So it, it was an interesting thing. When you get to the NFL, you're like, oh, I'm a professional athlete. And then it's – especially if you're a rookie and under that Patriot system is, like, you you better just forever be grateful that you're here and don't take anything for granted, which I understand the point in. But when you're trying to be at, like, a high level, you got to have a little bit of, hey, like – I can hold myself accountable. We don't need you to, like, hold our hand throughout everything. And especially that um, training camp, that's what it felt like. They were just forcing us to be there, so we had to be there. And it was – a lot of guys didn't respond to that well. Wow. I've never – this is very fascinating. Uh, I have, like, 9 million questions. But <laughs> yeah. a rookie skit, what, is, what does that mean? <laughs> Are you actually saying, like, hard knocks? Like, you guys mm -hmm. were, like, doing, like, an SNL sketch? Yeah. And they were just forcing you to be there to – do comedy pretty much um so <laughs> pretty much. well like at during training camp uh we'd have our team meetings and prior to meetings it was hey if you're a rookie get up there sing get up there do a skit you better have like a video ready if not just something to entertain the older guys and the coaches because we're there for 12 plus hours a day and if a rookie would make or to make a mistake then the entire rookie class had to do a 5 30 uh in the morning meeting and work on our, our skits. Now, and, <laughs> wait, hold on. Is this is this uniform in the NFL, or you're saying this is a Patriot thing where it's more so like he can't, they can't, the rookies have to be accountable in it. They could be doing worse stuff outside this, the facility. Mm -hmm. So even if they're here for no reason working on a sketch, yeah. we'd rather have them doing that than, you know, being at the club. Is that what you're trying to say? Pretty much. I mean, they just were trying to utilize our time so we didn't have extra time. <laughs> it's pretty. That's honestly the well, easiest Why wouldn't it. you use your extra time on football? Exactly. That, spot on. Um, and oh so there's so it. much wasted time of us meeting just to meet and not really gain anything from that than to actually be productive and then also give ourselves a little bit of us time and decompress because – there's a lot of stress in the NFL. And it's not like you're playing at, you know, let's just say, like, in, when you're playing at the University of Oregon, a mm. top-tier program, Yeah, that probably is more serious than this, it sounds <laughs> it, like. It felt like it, yeah. I mean, even at Oregon, we would do, like, a little tradition of if it's your first training camp, you would get up and sing, and then if you got clapped off, you're done for the, the training camp. So I, my first song I sang was Miss American Pie by Don McLean. Really? Yeah. Oh, throwback. <laughs> yeah, I oh, love all this. You're an old school guy. Okay. Yeah. And <clears throat> only one person, because I suck at pub, like speaking loudly, um, only one person caught on to the song I was singing. It was our backup quarterback, Jeff Lockie. Okay. And so thankfully I got clapped off the stage because they started to slowly catch on. But that's it's one time you're done easy. Whereas Detroit, it's especially with Patricia. It's you're doing it whenever, like whoever. If you're a rookie, it's just be prepared any day. So there was times where when I got older, they would force guys to go like multiple days in a row and just try to force them into that uncomfortable situation. And just it felt more so like they're breaking the guys than anything wow. because you can tell some guys are just truly that's not where they succeed at. And <laughs> Then if you mess up, you have that 5:30 in the morning uh, rookie meeting. It's just it sounds it's a shame. I'm, I'm my heart is breaking a little bit <laughs> hearing this because it sounds like it's a little more demeaning than it is about trying to build camaraderie. Which, yeah. But now how much of it is like if Bill Belichick mm -hmm. is telling you to do this? Well, that's Bill Belichick, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, it's like he's got the rings, right? Mm -hmm. and it's not that Patricia didn't, but. There's a big difference between Matt Patricia and Bill Belichick. So yep. do you feel like um, if if you were in the Patriots system where mm -hmm. it's trickle-down effect and, uh, you know, you have that feeling, I'm in a place that, where there's all these world titles and all yeah. that stuff, it would be, the buy-in would be easier, right? Oh, fully. <laughs> it would definitely be easier. And 
that was a, the knock a lot of guys had on Patricia, including myself, was you could definitely tell he was trying to be Belichick. There was only one time I can think of where I was talking to Matty P and not Coach Patricia. And that was after training camp. We had a, they had like a barbecue type of event in the facility to kind of finish off uh, training camp. Families were all invited. And he sat down at our table and was just finally like talking to us like people and not that authority figure. And that was one of the coolest conversations. I can't repeat much of it, but um, right. it was one of the coolest experiences because that was my first opportunity where he treated us like people and like he was talking to us like a person, not a not Belichick. And so I had a, I gained a lot of respect in that moment for him. But then afterwards, every time I've like had any encounters with him, it was him just trying to be like Belichick. So what's the what's the I mean, you're such a smart guy. I'm so happy mm -hmm. you're here with us because I'm learning so much about the dynamics of, you know, that's what's so funny. It's like. We're not even talking football, right? This <laughs> yeah. is not even X's and O's, and we're finding how teams are losing before they even get on the field just with leadership, yeah. you know? So when it comes to leadership, what is the, what's the take-home message? If you were telling an audience, because the same things that probably make a good football coach a good leader in that sense is the same things that make a great leader in business mm -hmm. or any other field. So what... What is that, what would you say as a player, what should have Patricia have done? How should, is it just about being yourself or what, what is that advice you would have for a guy who wants to succeed as a coach? Yeah, so like at that level, any guy in that facility player-wise has been around football long enough to know what a coach is. Um, so it's not necessarily you have to act like a coach 24 seven because we know that you're the coach. Um, so for me and carrying that over into my business, um, like all my employees know, like I'm the owner, but I'd never go around just, Hey, I'm the owner. What do you, what are you guys doing? It's, <laughs> they know it. I don't have to be like a jerk to guys. And I have to like remind myself, I don't really have to remind myself, but, uh, to just know, like they're people at the end of the day, they're also and people. So you think that's at the end of the day, it's an ins it's a self insecurity with a Patricia where he's almost not in belief that he's a coach mm -hmm. or he's got to prove it to himself that he has to act a certain way and get around yeah. other people rather than just. Mm -hmm. And because um, like we've had coaches like, so most people don't know, Patricia used to be an assistant online coach for the Patriots. And so the main coach there was Jeff Davidson, who was our offensive line coach. So Patricia was very hands off to the O-line opposed to other positions because he knew Jeff Davidson knew his stuff. And in my opinion, he's one of the best coaches I've ever had. Um, so thankfully as an O-line, we were left a little bit more alone and our coach, Coach Davison, was just one of the coolest people I've ever been around because he is truly himself. And as an O-line unit, we responded very well to, and like, if you look at offensive line play in Detroit, it's been pretty good throughout yeah. the past couple of years. And that's one catalyst to it because our coach has just truly been himself, let us be ourselves, but also like let us know there's an accountability level that we still have to maintain if you want to be able to have that like that coworker respect because in the NFL it's yes there's coaches players but it's also a sense of like we are also coworkers so um you would say is cuz the knock on Belichick in the patriot way is like sometimes they try to find players to fit their system rather yeah. than taking a player and leaning into their strengths yep how would you if you were a gm or a coach and you're running a team how would you conduct the team would you be trying to find players who can buy into your system or would you yeah. just try to attract the best talent and then put them in a position to succeed um definitely the latter of the two um try to find the players who kind of fit a mold that we're somewhat looking for but they don't have to be exact by any means and just let them do what they do best um I think a really good example of that would be the Rams when they won their last Super Bowl. They brought in Stafford, brought in guys who could just do what they do. Um, OBJ being one of them, unfortunately he got hurt. But they brought in the talent and let them just go out there and play. How was Stafford? Speaking of Stafford, you <laughs> played with him. Nine, awesome. He's phenomenal. Um, he might be one of the most intelligent football minds I've ever been around. 
What it, was so? In, what what made him so smart? We'd be on the line, and I know football fairly well, but I'd like start reading where the linebackers are, see where the safety rotation is, trying to figure out who if that line or that uh, corner can blitz based on safety rotation. And I'd look over and see like single high, so he's not a cap. He doesn't have a capped safety over him. I'm like, there's no way he can blitz. And then Stafford would just go ahead, flip the protection, and then have a slide that way. And sure enough, that corner is coming off the edge. So the amount of film that man has watched, I don't even know how to even compute it. It's it has to be so much, and his knowledge is just unreal. Wow. Yeah. So he would really – he's one of those guys. He could just read defenses. Oh, well. my gosh. At, yeah. what, at what point in your height, in your, like, football career, mm -hmm. you know, because how old were you when you started playing? I was football. about eight. So when you're eight, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, at what point in your career do you start learning how to read defenses? <laughs> like, is that at Green Valley or is that in college? Um, a little bit at Green Valley because, honestly, high school defensive coaches are super easy to read. <laughs> um, so a little bit at – at Green Valley, and then when I got to Oregon and then understood the structure of defenses and how they really operate, um, I definitely took a big leap in my knowledge of rating defenses. And one of my favorite uh, things at Oregon my freshman year was if we saw any type of possible pressure, you'd signal to the quarterback to let him know. And at Oregon, because Marcus, Oh, our signal was just go like that to him. Oh. So there's somewhere like a, in the Michigan State game, you just see me over my head like doing gotcha. one of those to let him know like that dude's coming. Gotcha. Um, so it really took the biggest step going into college. And then NFL was just really refining my knowledge um, because they disguise better and it's a little bit harder to read in the NFL. Gotcha. So NFL is just more refining. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, this is what's so crazy. I mean, being an offensive lineman in the NFL, you have to be so freaky athletic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for the size that you're at to be that quick on your feet. I mean, yeah. tell me what makes a perfect NFL lineman. Like, what is this? Because it's almost like being a ballerina, <laughs> but at like 350 pounds and 6'5", right? <laughs> yes. Um, there's a lot to it. And any offensive line coach will tell you the first thing is, probably bend your knees so you can play with leverage which i sucked at um there's not a single game where i had the o-line coach tell me not tell me hey you need to bend your knees um did i say that right yeah <laughs> i had to think about that one but uh <laughs> it's honestly just a leverage game so you want to just play lower and then ultimately just out compete whoever's in front of you so that was my big mindset when the play is happening is i'm going to out compete you and i don't care what i need to do but I'm going to figure out how to, I'm going to outwork you on this one play because the more you just do that, the more it just breaks that D lineman down and just makes them exhausted. And especially for O linemen, we don't have backups. Well, we do, but we're not like a third and long. We're not bringing in a pass right. specialist. Right. We're out there the entire game until we can't be. Right. So it's definitely the biggest thing is play with leverage and have that mindset of you are going to win no matter what. When you're in Detroit, you had like Frank was there, yep. Taylor Decker or something. Mm -hmm. were, were you on the blind side? What side of the ball were, were you a left or right tackle? So my first year I was playing swing tackle. So I was our backup for left and uh, right because you're only allowed X amount of players to dress. So usually at, on the offensive line, they're only dressing seven guys. So I was our swing tackle. Then I went in to be in our right tackle. And then it, my first game – starting a left tackle would have been the Chargers in my second year. And I was going against Joey Bosa, which was fun for me because I played in my freshman year at Oregon in oh, the yeah. National Championship. So I'm like, oh, finally some revenge. <laughs> um, so that was my first time playing left tackle, or starting left tackle. And it was a blast. I mean, left tackle for me is always where I've been most comfortable at. Just cause most people think, oh, if you can play right tackle, you can easily go play left tackle. No, it's a but, big difference. Yeah, it's like riding right-handed your entire life and then saying, hey, like, you hurt your right hand, go right everything in the left hand because um, everything is truly mirrored. So it's not as easy oh. as it, it is, like, out so, actually doing. So really the big distinction with that, I mean, most quarterbacks are righty. Mm -hmm. So being a left tackle, that's the whole big thing with the blind, blind side and yeah. protecting the blind side because that's where the quarterback's not, you know, mm -hmm. really their their vision's not really there where they see the 
you know, edge coming more so from the right. Yeah. But you're saying it's more so when you're a left tackle, it's more so like you have to be able, you have to be dominant on your left hand mm -hmm. to be, and on your as a right tackle, you're more dominant on your right. Yeah. So Interesting. Like, for me, when I was at right tackle, throwing my left hand is my favorite thing to do. So uh, when I was at right tackle, I'd have to throw it across my body to try to stop the DN, whereas if I'm at left, and I can do that initial punch, it's a lot more confined. I'm not, like, crossing gotcha. over my body. So everything just came so much more natural when I was at left. When we're going up, I mean, let's – I mean, these edges now, I mean, mm -hmm. they're making, like, almost the most money after the <laughs> quarterback, right? Yeah. I mean, we've seen Nick Bosa get new deals mm -hmm. now. And, I mean, these guys like Miles Garrett, I mean, these guys are incredible. Yeah. Um, what is it like facing a Joey Bosa? I mean, you faced – I'm sure you faced – uh, Miles Garrett, right? Uh, Did you ever go up against him? I haven't gone against Miles, but I've gone against JJ Watt, Chandler Jones, Joey Bosa, Cam Jordan, like a pretty great group of guys. What about Mac? Khalil Mac? I've gone it? against Khalil. Yeah. So, what? Who was the most difficult to face? I mean, who was you were just like, oh no. From a pure football standpoint, JJ Watt. I mean, he his one. He has a really quick swim. And like a hand swipe, but he's going 100 percent every play. It's in incredible, honestly. It's truly incredible because he will give you 100 percent on every play. And so we played them my third year on Thanksgiving, and JJ just finished having a pick six on us. Thankfully, he wasn't on my side, so not my <laughs> fault. <laughs> um, but the next series, he's fully like going still 100 percent in my head. I'm like, you gotta be a little bit exhausted. Like you just ran 30 yards full speed. Like, you got to dial wow. it back a little bit. Nope. He was still fully going 100%. His stamina is unbelievable. And so that was on Thanksgiving. And after that game, I had such a bad headache because I was just so dehydrated from freaking working so hard that entire game. It's like, all right, I'm going to go home, nap real quick, and then I'll go out to the store, grab food. So that game is an early kickoff. And I didn't end up waking up till like, 10. So for Thanksgiving Day, my third year, the only thing that was open food wise, because I didn't have anything in my house, was McDonald's. Oh my God! <laughs> so I went to make I went to McDonald's after playing the NFL game, going they, against JJ. They didn't the, they didn't have a, like a team Thanksgiving. Uh, so they like, they'll have like post game snacks for us to have post game snacks. And like there's like a there's like chicken strips. I think we had like turkey and gravy because they did a little bit lean into that Thanksgiving Day theme, yeah. <laughs> but not like anything too crazy. And the game ended at like. I want to say like 3.34. So, I mean, had a quick bite to eat at the stadium, went home, had the headache. I was like, I'm going to bed real fast. Take a quick nap. Wake up at 10. Nothing open. How much, like, uh, <laughs> how much is, you know, um, how much did you have to combat just, like, the loneliness of being, like, in a, going to a place you've never lived before? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, is there camaraderie amongst teammates, or is it is it kind of lonely? How how was it for you just being a professional athlete in that sense? Yeah, I mean, the worst was definitely that third year when it was COVID year, um, because the penalties if you got COVID were like pretty bad. Um, so I was telling my friends, family, I'm like, there's one, you guys can't go to the game, so there's no point to travel out here. And two, it's like, I don't want to test positive and then miss a game. Right. So please don't come over. Right. Um, so it was it was hard some days, um, especially being out in Michigan. I mean, grew up West Coast my whole life. Yeah. So being in the Midwest by myself, really not knowing too many people. Yeah. Definitely, definitely was hard the first two years, but then that third year with COVID was like it was really difficult. And what about the cold? I mean, just like is that is something? Do you actually have to think about that? Like being a guy who grew up, you know, uh, more so in Vegas, like, and you're playing now in Detroit in these winters. Is it like I have to get used to this stuff? So like I'm a big person. I run warm, and I know that. So usually I keep my like place pretty cold, and I I enjoy the cold a lot. So it didn't bother me too much. However, no one told me Detroit gets humid. Oh, so. So in my head, I'm like, oh, only the South gets humid. I was wrong. And it was our first, like, pretty warm day in Detroit, and it's still, like, 85, 90, but, like, 90% humidity. Right. There's no humidity here in Vegas. No, this or in different. Oregon. So that was new to me. And, oh, I needed an IV after that practice. I was unwell. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> it, it sucked. How much um, – I'm curious about this. Like, um, 
do you when you're having because you're just i just love how frank you are with things yeah um like the camaraderie amongst team like when you're having meals mm -hmm. with the team after practices and just daily stuff cafeteria yeah like are you always sitting with the same people or would you sit with darius slay one day or would you sit with you know kenny galladay or are you only sitting with like the o-line like how does nah. that stuff work i mean thankfully for my personality i can comfortably bounce around different position groups i mean in college i had a linebacker as a roommate and a db as a roommate so like i'm so used to being around different position yeah. groups because they're there definitely is a different personality between each. Group. But is that a Tyrell Crosby thing, or like, or and you're just special in the fact that you can mm -hmm. swing in that kind of sense, or do most people just kind of like stay with their position? Groups? Most people tend to stay in their position. Groups. Really? Yeah, unless they have like a good friend outside. Like, but vast majority is you're staying within that position group because that's where your most of your friends are. Whereas, like for me, I'm like. You guys are all my friends. Screw it. So you would sit with, like, anybody? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It didn't matter, like, if you were a DB. Me and Prater always would uh, hang out with one another. Shoot, I was talking to Prater last week. As he was our kicker. Right. Um, but, yeah, like, I didn't care who you were on the team. I had no problem sitting with What you. about a Stafford? Was he the type of leader? Like, I have this – I don't know. I was watching Hard Knocks, and I never was a Aaron Rodgers guy. Mm -hmm. And then I'm watching Hard Knocks, and I'm like, this guy's kind of like – you know, he, I don't know, he, he impressed me with his leadership stuff, and yeah. he mentioned one thing in the huddle about, like, try to sit with somebody else every day mm -hmm. during training camp. And, like, how was Stafford with that? Was Stafford sitting with the same people every day, or would he sit, you know? So the quarterbacks are an interesting group of people, <laughs> um, especially at that level. Yeah. So usually he was sitting with, like, the other quarterbacks. So my rookie year would have been him, Matt Castle. Um, okay. And it's mainly because they're still talking football, gotcha. where everyone else is like, relax. Yeah, it's like, uh, this is lunchtime. I'm not talking football right now. Whereas, the, like, Stafford would sit and just talk nonstop football with the other guys, just trying to, like, figure out where he can take that next, like, gotcha. level. Um, so he was mainly, like, surrounded by the other quarterbacks or, like, the center, um, Frank. But it wasn't ever, like – in any like bad way it was just mm -hmm. because he was just 100 percent like thinking business right then wow mm -hmm. and does a, i mean somebody like that like because you're his o-line and you're protecting him yeah. when it's your birthday does he like get you something very special or something you know i, I that's uh, why i'm trying to understand yeah. the dynamics so. of an nfl franchise like and what this <laughs> is like like is it i have a lot of yeti gear because of stafford okay i mean i have a lot of Yeti <laughs> supplies because of him. Each year he'd get us a good like Christmas present. Um, one year was, I think I got like 15, 20 things of Yeti coolers. Wow. Um, sent to me. Oh, that's cool. Another year he's like, uh, asked like, what's your favorite like high end type of alcohol? Just as like, like Merry Christmas type of thing. So he would always take care of us, and it was awesome, especially in my rookie year because college it was not like that at all because. At least then you weren't getting any type of like finance uh, yeah. other than your stipend. So most guys were very much like can't really afford to give your whole O line gifts. Where we'll say Marcus did um, going into the national championship. Marcus gave each O lineman a hundred dollar gift card and a handwritten note at Oregon. Yeah. So if you were starting, I, I want to say is all the starters going into the national championship game. He wrote a thank you letter or well, like a thank you note. And then put $100 in there. And $100 to a freshman in college, huge. So um, it was one of the coolest things I've ever experienced. And then going into the league, Stafford made sure each Christmas to take care of us. What was that national championship game like? <laughs> that was my first time in AT&T Stadium. And it was interesting because when the defense was on the field, and I don't have you seen that screen? Uh, at Cowboy Stadium, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's massive. So I, I had the best view in the entire stadium. Like, <laughs> guys were paying like twenty grand to sit, like right. behind me, and I was still watching the game on the like the big screen. Wow. I was just on the bench, like after our O line coach was done yelling at us. I just wow. sit up there watching the game on the big screen. <laughs> what was the final score of that game? I think it was twenty forty two off the top of my head. I wow. mean, that Ohio State team. Easily is a top five best team ever to play at, really? like college football, in my opinion. Yes, they were so good. Who was on that team again? So they had Taylor Decker, who was the Lions' left tackle, was 
while I was there. Ezekiel Elliott, uh, Joey Bosa, uh, Eli Apple, I want to say, was there. Yeah. Um, that team was just so stacked. They're, they're just, I want to say, minimum 15 guys on that team are in the league still. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. And, um, man, that's just so fascinating. And so when it comes to then playing at an elite level in the pros and you're doing your thing, um, how do you stop a Joey Bosa? Like, so what is the game plan? Like when you're facing a Mac or a Cameron Jordan, like what are you talking about? And what do you actually, what's the game plan in your head? So like, I mean, Joey Bosa, cause I still remember his movesets pretty well. Um, he's looking to set you up outside, double hand swipe inside. So when you're watching film throughout that week, it's, you are studying you're trying to find an offensive tackle that plays similar to you and then study how Joey plays to that. So you can learn, all right, this is what happens if you, you try to jump set him or if you try to just take different pass sets or, like, do a little hand flash. Um, and then you see how he reacts so you can understand what you need to be practicing throughout the week. Or if you have a guy on defense, um, like a scout team guy or something, just be like, hey, can you rush me this way because this is how he rushes mm-hmm. just to give me the look so I can understand – the movement that I need to do to try to like combat what Joey loves to do on certain pass sets. Um, Khalil Mack is just a freak. He's so strong. Um, so with like Khalil Mack is just be patient and get low because he's going to just try to long arm you and he's, or like the uh, bull rush. So it's just be prepared for speed to power from Khalil Mack. Um, each guy is very much different, but they all have like a subcategory that is similar that you can kind of learn from. Hmm. And who did you pancake in the NFL that just felt like the best feeling of all time? Oh, St- Khalil Mack, 100%. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. This was my freshman year. We're playing at Chicago. <laughs> and uh, not my freshman year, my rookie year. Yeah. Um, and I just kept driving him. And I w- he may have gotten tripped up a little bit, but I I don't see it. <laughs> but, um. Now, our second year, second year, not my fresh, or not my rookie year. But uh, that was the first time where I was like, okay, maybe I'm like not bad at this sport. <laughs> and because Khalil, he's he's very talented. At that point, he was still very much highly regarded. Yeah. And so when I did that, it was a really cool like, hey, I do belong out here moment for me. And did anybody ever put you <laughs> on your butt? Oh, easy. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, Daniel Hunter. Oh yeah, Viking. Vikings DN number ninety. Yeah. He's not 99. 99, yeah. Uh, Everson Griffin. Yeah, they, oh, they had seven. those two ends. It was not, yeah, they were okay. tough. Um, so we were running a screenplay to the right. And if you're usually the front side tackle on a screen, yeah. you're just pass setting to like have that DN think he has you beat. Yeah. So you're just doing a very soft pass set, letting him just run up the field, taking himself out of the play. Yeah. And I did it a little too softly and ended up catching a long arm into the chest. Oh. And that was the first time where I'm just like, Wow. I'm going down. <laughs> you have? Do you have like a? And I want to get into insurance with you because this yeah. is fascinating. Do you have like a photographic memory? Like, how do you remember all these like specific plays and mm-hmm. times? And do you have like a? Not really. It's just because like something like that. I th- I found it just so funny where it's like it's hard for me to forget. Yeah. Um. Because it's like. Yeah. I'm not gonna harp on it. He he's in the NFL too. He's a freak athlete. Like, I'm not gonna go out there and play a perfect game if any nfl player says they play, played a perfect game they're lying right there's so many mistakes throughout the game and for me that's my favorite thing is learning from mistakes so i'm like throughout practice i want to make the most rational mistakes possible because that's how i can learn mm-hmm. and then in the game if i under or not understand but set too softly and i get put on my back well hey i don't want to set softly again i want to learn from that so that doesn't happen mm-hmm. so a lot of my funny NFL stories come from me making a mistake and learning from it. Mm-hmm. And it kind of just burns that memory into me. When you're like on the lines and it's like, you know, it, unfortunately, you know, it was six and 10, mm-hmm. three, 12 and one yeah. in 2019 and five and 11 in that 2020. And there, you know, Patricia got fired mm-hmm. mid year or something. But um, when you're like three, 12 and one, even at the beginning of the season, you know how like in hard knocks and everybody's like, yeah, we can, we can win the oh, everyone, Super Bowl. You know? Everyone goes you, into it. Do you like still it. like, does that team actually think they're winning the Super Bowl or? No. Oh, of course not. <laughs> um, so I have, but you know what I'm saying? There's a, there's this like <laughs> narrative that everybody's like, oh, we all have a shot at like the Lombardi trophy, mm-hmm. but 
does anybody actually maybe Stafford? There becomes a point where you kind of realize it's out of reach. Um, okay. You're still going out and compete because you don't want to look stupid, but you definitely lose a little bit of motivation. I don't care who you are. There's still a little bit of motivation once you realize, hey, we we can't make playoffs even if we went out. Um, that gets lost because guys just you know it. Um, so one example, my freshman. I always want to say freshman. My <laughs> rookie year. So it's our first game. I want to say it was Quandre Diggs, yeah. maybe, who had a pick six. It was like the first play of the season. And I was like, oh, okay, the Lions might be good this year. And I was kind of excited because it was immediate pick, pick six. And then the rest of the game happened, and we lost by like 30. Oh. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, this is awkward. Um, and then throughout that season, it kind of dwindles down. And one thing, I don't know if, some guys talk about it, but this was after my second year we're playing the Packers. It's like the last game. And the person I was going against, I kind of gave him an extra little shove after the play. And he looks at me. He's like, dude, we have a bye week and your season's over with. Like, settle down. And I kind of looked at him. I was like, are you saying what I think you're saying? And if you look at the game, we, we move our feet very well. <laughs> like, do we... We have there's like a weird understanding between guys of knowing, hey, this is still professional football, and we our season's done with after this game. You guys have a bye week and then going into the playoffs, let's not hurt one another. So, some guys make it look good for TV. That's what I'm trying to get at. Um, Interesting. I won't say who it was, but it was one of the funniest moments because he was an all pro and a very very good DN, and he kind of just looked at me and was like, hey, just. Let's dial it back a little bit, make it look good for TV. And it wasn't anything like – we were still both trying, but it was like none of the extra like pushing, shoving, trying to like pancake one guy. We we're just doing our best ability, we'll staying professional, and then just keeping one another safe. Gotcha. Very fascinating. Yeah. Um, so um, let's just before we get into all you know your life now. So mm -hmm. let's talk about your injury and so kind of how did your career kind of come to an end? Yeah, so going into my fourth year, um, it's our first pad of practice, and we're doing, um, it's called pods. It's three on three. It's three, or it's usually two D linemen and linebacker versus three O linemen or two O linemen tight end. And I'm blocking the, um, we're having inside zone right, and I'm blocking the D end, and we're doing a B block up to the linebacker, and I feel something in my left hamstring kind of not feel too pleasant. So. Immediately, I knew I pulled my hamstring, and I go over to the trainer. like, hey, my hamstring's pulled. It's happened before. I don't care. I can play through it just fine. So finish practice with a pulled hamstring just fine. Even do, like, some extra pass, uh, like, just uh, pass rush practice at, at the end of practice, one-on-ones, and just dominate. And I'm going against, like, our ones, too. Like, I'm doing very good with the pulled hamstring. And even our assistant online coach was like, you're doing all that on a pulled hamstring? I'm like, yeah, it's, it hurts. But it's whatever, like, it's football. I'm used to it being in constant pain. And then after that, the trainers, like, kind of pulled me out from the rest of that week's practice and wanted me to rehab it. So I was like, all right, that makes sense. And so as I'm rehabbing it, I can feel my hamstring itself start to feel better and kind of get back to normal. But I'm having this weird tingling down my leg still, and I'm telling the trainers, like, hey, like, my hamstring's feeling good, but I don't know what's going on. And so they kind of just keep holding me out, and I talk to my agent, and he's like, oh, it sounds like you have sciatica. I'm like, yeah, that all kind of adds up. So I go to the trainers and say, hey, this is what my agent is thinking is wrong with me. Wait, um, so the trainers can't even di diagnose this? Why are they not thinking, oh, you might have sciatica? Uh, NFL trainers and doctors are more like mechanics than actual doctors. Their job is to get you back out there as fast as possible, and if it's ethical, it's 50-50. Um, they just want you, their job is to make sure you get there out as fast as possible back onto the field. So they're not really fully focused on what's truly wrong with you. Um, there was one point in time I had five different pain medis or pain subscriptions, uh, <laughs> prescribed to me, uh, cause they just want, not all of them, some are better than others, but as if you can get out there and play, they don't care how. Wait. Okay, hold hold on a yeah. second. I, 
this sounds like we're talking like, you know, the Jim Brown era of the <laughs> NFL. I mean, yeah. this is happening in the NFL right now. Oh, yeah. I can They're not treat, they don't even treat you like a person? No, no. So, like, uh, the first prescription that they signed off on me was, I want to say it's Indocin. And they just have them. It's locked, to be fair, but there's a medicine cabinet just full of already prescribed bottles. And then all they do is write your name on it, have the doctor sign off, and then give it to you. So, like, it's it's a very uh, interesting side of the league that most people are unaware of. Right. And so I figured out going through it. Um, so, like, I told the the training staff, like, hey, my agent thinks, like, I have sciatica. Can we check for it? And their response was, oh, no, it's you just pulled your hamstring. Your sciatic nerve runs through your hamstring. So you're – your hamstring's tight, so that's what's causing it, your sciatic nerve to, like, not be able to really function as well. I'm like, okay, yeah, you guys know better than me. I'm, I'm just a freaking player. You guys went to school for this. Okay. And it just wasn't getting any better at all. And finally, we're going into that last preseason game, and I had the acting, like, head um, team trainer, Tom Colt, come up to me, and he's like, hey, do you think you can play a few – few snaps and me being me it's like i played a game on a broken foot like what's eight snaps to me so i slowly kind of like get back into the um the routine of play, like practicing and all that and it was very much limited but after my first practice my back was in a non-stop spasm um and <laughs> so i went and get got treatment on that and it just my back hurt so bad <laughs> and then they gave me another stronger medicine to help with that um and the game day came, and I was nowhere near even 70%. My ham, I could barely straighten my like entire body straight without my hamstring feeling like it just wants to tear apart. And having that like weird nerve just down my, or that nerve pain down my entire leg. And I go out there, play the eight snaps, but I, it was one of the most painful things I've ever done. Um, after the game, my back was just pretty much seizing up completely. Uh, my hamstring was just miserable. I had that sharp nerve pain down my leg. And afterwards, it's like I was looking at the doctor's notes, and like the team doctor's like, oh, Tyrell even got to go out there and play today. I'm like, I was in so much pain, and you guys gave me so much pain medicine to help it. <laughs> um, and so that's when I learned about the, the genuine business side of the NFL that most people are very much unaware of and how brutal it can be on that individual. And so going this was sep on s august 30th i want to say the team like brought me in when i walked in had me go meet the gm and brad holmes was like hey thank you for playing through an injury you think you have because i at that point i was telling the staff like hey like i, I something's definitely wrong with my back they just want to believe it um but he's like yeah thank you for playing through the injuries that you think you have um right now we have to injury wave you which all that kind of means is you're still on the team but if a team wants to pick you up on waivers, they can. If not, you just get put on IR. So I got no team picked me up because they were weren't aware of like what my injury was, and I got put on IR. Um, found out that a lot of the coaching staff thought I was faking my injury because um, they thought I wanted to get traded, and so they were just being as reluctant as possible to actually help me uh, to the point where they tried to like they wanted me to go in for an epidural shot to help with that nerve pain. Um, pretty much put a cortisone shot in my nerve to like kind of help numb it and that nurse was like oh yeah just drink some coffee after 48 hours you should like those headaches should go away because they puncture your uh some like some something in your back um to help like put where they inject it and I was like all right whatever first 48 hours were miserable because you you have sign or not sinus headaches but uh you have some pretty bad headaches and after that, I was like, these headaches aren't going away. Like, something's wrong, but I had no clue what it was. So I'm texting our trainer because they're having me do all my physical therapy off-site. Um, so I'm texting the head trainer, like, hey, it's, something's something's wrong. He's like, all right, well, let me know how you feel next day. Good luck at physical therapy. And finally, it was the week of the Oregon-Ohio State game in 21. And that Saturday, because I was planning on going to that game, but I just I couldn't because my head was hurting so bad. And, like, I couldn't play video games. I couldn't do anything. And I wake up, and it's just the most miserable pain that is in my head. And I was 
bound to my living room floor that entire day. I could not move. And finally that night, um, I thought I was dying. And like, I ended up falling asleep because of like having so many like panic attacks and just purely from exhaustion. And so that next morning, that Sunday morning, I reach out to our, um, to that same trainer and let him know, like I was in debilitating pain. Like I could not move. And his response was, Oh, talk to your physical therapist on it about it Monday. Maybe change up what you guys are doing there. And I'm just like, what? Like, you're supposed to be the guy helping me. How are you going to respond to, like, I was, I thought I was dying. Like, I genuinely thought I was dying. And so then I was like, felt a little bit better and started like going on the Google, <laughs> trying to do WebMD and everything that lined up with what I just had done, the epidural shot, corresponded with having um, spinal fluid leaking. So I found out that when they did the epidural shot that puncture never closed so i was having spinal fluid leak which it's easily the worst thing i've ever gone through like nothing even comes kind of close and so at that point i lost so much trust in the medical staff like i just messaged the hospital myself which is unheard of if you're a professional athlete because they want to keep everything in-house to like because they don't want any news to break like oh this player's in the hospital they try to keep that very much all in house to keep it secret. But I lost so much faith in that medical staff where I'm like, screw this. Like I'm reaching out myself and <clears throat> ended up going in, getting a blood patch to uh, close that puncture. And that's when I really realized like a lot of NFL trainers and doctors don't truly have your best interest at heart. I'm so, I feel so, I mean, I'm uh, I'm emotional for <laughs> yeah. how bad of this. I mean, so they didn't close that. They were on. I mean, it was kind of their fault that they didn't close that that yeah. opening where the epidural shot went in. Yeah, and it's like it is a complication with getting like that shot done with that procedure. But especially on the training staff, because the nurses like send over all like I get a copy of the paperwork. The team gets a copy of like all the possible complications. So if you even gave like half a look, you know like that is a very much a real possibility. And for his response to just constantly be like, yeah, but let us know how you feel tomorrow. So is, and just, I'm just in living in a world of, in a state of shock right now, yeah. frankly. But so, I mean, as a medical professional who takes like a, a Hippocratic oath, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, to serve people from a health standpoint, I mean, are they just turning a blind eye? I mean, how they, they can't not, <laughs> think that there's maybe as a human being that mm. there's an issue right or i mean yeah but it's just part of like it's part of what you sign up for is you have to kind of turn your back to some of these types of things and that's yeah. just part of the game so like going through the whole experience it's they know what they're doing in a horrible way for the player um because they know just how little they can do but say hey we made a very conscious effort to help this guy um but in reality they really didn't do anything um wow so yeah and they just so like that happened in september and even then like the team just kept saying like oh you're faking your back injury you're faking your back injury and so i was doing physical therapy outside up until um october midway through october and at this point I'm like like this physical therapy is not helping whatsoever. This pain is just getting worse and worse. So my agent had me go fly out to LA and meet with a very like well-respected spine surgeon. Um, like he's done a lot of guys in the NFL um, throughout the league. He's very, very respected. Um, his name is Robert Watkins and he's going over all like my images and um, kind of everything. And he kind of just looks at me. He's like, do you know how bad your back actually is? And I'm like, no, because they wouldn't test me for anything. They didn't do an MRI. They didn't do anything to really look at my back. Like, I got my MRI um, in September because I went to an outside doctor, to a second opinion doctor, and he's who scheduled my MRI. Um, the team didn't. And, and so he kind of, like, really walked me through just how bad my back was, and it was to the point where my L5-S1 disc was essentially completely gone. And it caused my spine to collapse down into the left, and then it cr was crushing my side canal. And because of that, a bone spur had grown, and it grew directly into my uh, sciatic nerve. So my sciatic nerve was both being crushed, and then something Pierce. trying to yeah. Wow. 
and <laughs> um, it was one of the like listening to tell me that I pretty much say like no, this is worst case scenario for it was the real eye opener of like oh I might not ever play football again, and we kind of went um, our game plan to like kind of attack it was hey, we'll change up my physical therapy, do everything Robert Watkins is telling me to do. Because um, a lot of low back issues c- can help or be resolved by doing a lot of ab workouts um, just because it helps take the strain off your back and put it more on your abs and your core. So I was doing a ton of ab workouts every single day, just following his uh, program as best as I could. And after like, uh, I want to say five weeks of it, it just it wasn't helping at all, and I was just in so much misery because it's every morning you wake up eight out of ten in pain, and it just doesn't go away. If anything, it worsens throughout the day. Um, it just it sucks being in that much pain. And in November, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I was just so exhausted, mentally drained, just physically just miserable. And so I reached out to my agent. I was like, I I think it's it's time that I I do my spine fusion because that's what they had to go do. And so he reached out to the team got to like get it all set up. And so I'm like, all right, well, perfect timing. My my apartment lease ended in December. Um, so um, packed up all, like had my mom fly out, helped me pack up my place in, in Michigan. And it was like my second to last day in Michigan, like living there. I called the team to make sure like everything was in place for my surgery. And the like, head trainer was like, oh, I didn't know you, you were getting surgery. I'm like, dude, what? <laughs> you guys were the ones who were supposed to be like setting this all up like (laughs) what and thankfully it like all got taken care of had my surgery december 14th um out in marina del rey and then did a year-long recovery and throughout that process i just realized it's like i can really if i wanted to i could get get back into football but i couldn't play with my knees prior to my surgery like because my back was just in so much pain so it was just like do I want to have this surgery, get back into it, and just destroy my back more to the point when the day comes where I have kids, I can't play with them? Or just kind of accept that I'm okay with leaving behind football and starting a new venture? Wow. Well, first of all, thank you for being so frank and honest. <laughs> oh, and, of course. Um, man, I, I mean, I feel so bad hearing that story. I hope, <laughs> I mean, taking away from that, I'm like, wow, having an agent really – helps yeah you know, somebody oh gosh, who's yeah. looking out for your interest because you would just think that the team would be doing that mm-hmm. is, and that's what i thought too that's it, what kind of sucked <laughs> as you talk with guys former players current players is it is this more of a blanket thing across the league or is it a lions thing um for my case it's definitely a lions thing i mean most of that staff is now fired um like training wise and doctors like they're no longer with the team and i know other teams throughout the league are very similar and if I'm being honest, it's mainly like the lower end teams, like the teams that are constantly not that good throughout the league. You hear more stories coming out of those facilities rather than like the top teams. Man, it's so crazy. And that's why it goes back to, I mean, so much of it is like luck, you know, and where mm-hmm. you go and, you know, from things that aren't even X's and O's. It's it's a crazy yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. And it's, it's scary because, I mean, you know, I think fans don't understand – you know, the level of pain that you play current, just constantly with, even mm-hmm. if there's, you know, nothing too big wrong. Like, you're probably operating, like you said, at 70% most games anyway. Yeah. You know, so when there's a problem, there's a problem. I mean, you said you play with a broken foot. I can't even <laughs> imagine, you know, <laughs> walking to Chipotle with a broken foot, you know. So, I mean, it's it's crazy um, what you have to go for through and all that stuff. But that leads you, I'm sure all this experience and has probably served you nicely now in this new career you have, because you have, a, mm-hmm. it sounds like you, you have a, a lot of empathy and yeah. you, you seem like a really great, genuine guy. So tell me a little bit about how this is, you know, serving you now, your football and all these experiences, how mm-hmm. this is helping you serve other people through insurance. Yeah, so going into my fourth year of the league, one of my amazing friends, uh, Michael DeLaGrange, he played at Oregon 2000 to 2004. Um, he had an insurance company that he started called Insurance Lounge. And finally, going back in 20, 2020, like end of 2020, he reached out and was like, hey, 
um, our company is kind of big enough where I'm comfortable franchising. Do you want to franchise? It took me a few months to kind of like get comfortable with it because it is a lot of money and it's terrifying to invest and realize you, you're about to own a business. So it truly is terrifying. Um, but finally, I was like, it makes sense, and I want to have something grow while I play football. Well, timing worked out. I was oh, ended up opening the store while I'm doing my recovery. And, yeah, so we are over on St. Rose, um, right across from the Costco. Our company, the store is called Insurance Lounge. It's my franchise. And our whole thing there, what kind of, like, sets us apart is we want to be more than an agent. Our All my agents are non-commissioned based. They're all salaried. So, so often with insurance and something I've dealt with my first few uh, years in the league was an insur- insurance agent knows like, hey, you're making this much money. I know I can upsell you on products you don't need because they get a chunk of that commission. So a lot of times agents are selling you so much things you don't need because it helps line their pockets where this is why I loved Michael's approach to insurance is, hey, let's make them a salary position and treat them more as concierge services and help you guide and educate throughout your insurance process rather than just try to sell you stuff yeah um because so many agents that i've dealt with like whether it's in college or my first few years in the league it's they're truly just trying to sell you as much policies as possible trying to like line their own pockets and yeah no it. i've dealt with that even personally like yeah. with insurance like life insurance and yep. so what kind of insurance are you do you work with all kinds i mean so we do all personal lines and then we're right now um getting into more commercial as well um and i mean because he just he deserves to be mentioned his name is mark Klinger, one of the greatest humans i've ever been around he's who does our like retirement planning he does um health life and i've seen him stay like two hours late just sitting with couples just who like because in Nevada the health here is kind of weird, um, so he we had no commissions, no anything. He was just guiding them through the health uh, website to show them how to do their health insurance, because um, it, it's Nevada's kind of funky with health insurance, uh, at least private health insurance, and yeah, he just did that out of the kindness of his heart. And for me, as like my personality, seeing him do that was so awesome because I'm like, he truly, it's, you see him care about. The, the clients more than anything, not how is he going to make a quick buck off of them. And it's something I can appreciate um, with my whole background because football for me, the reason why I loved it was never about the money, wasn't about anything being verified on social media. I, I don't care about that. I went out there because my teammates I consider as friends and I had a genuine passion for making sure they were protected. If that means I had to get... <laughs> A massive deed tackle running through me or Daniel Hunter trying to uh, knock me on my butt so be it as long as you're protected I'm happy and that's what really made me find that passion for doing insurance out here is this is my opportunity to kind of give back to my community where I was like when I moved out here it was me my three siblings and my mom uh, they just parents got divorced out here uh, so this community's done so much for me as a person it's like oh this is my opportunity to kind of give back and just help people with things something that no one wants to deal with no one wants to deal with insurance um so through michael's like kind of envision of like this uh insurance lounge we're the people dealing with the 1-800 numbers you don't have to it's like trust us because they're like genuinely every one of my agents i would speak so highly of because they truly are like i have nothing but the most faith in them um just to go out and truly look after the client not their own selves wow i have goosebumps just hearing you listen just listening to you and hearing you talk about all this stuff (laughs) i mean and you can't help but get excited about the the parallels of you know protecting your quarterback Mm -hmm. protecting your team and protecting your customers uh now through insurance so that's a beautiful thing and i've seen on social media it looks like a beautiful (laughs) setup i see you watch you're watching some monday night football games in there it's it's a real why lounge insurance lounge because it's it's it's, because it's a good place to hang it's supposed to be comfortable that's a big thing especially if you're going in person like it can be intimidating um i don't care who you are talking insurance if you're not knowledgeable about it and you have one person who is and one person who's not, it's going to be very intimidating for that person who's not um, because you can easily get taken advantage of. And I, that's one thing that kind of was scary going into it because I'm like, if I'm hiring someone, I want them to know, like, you better put the clients first. And thankfully, I, all my employees do do that. But now how do we 
ease that for the client to be comfortable also. And if you look in our store, it's we have a little lounge area, massive TV. I have a bunch of jerseys um, hung up all over. And it's supposed to create that atmosphere of, like, this is supposed to be relaxing. It's not supposed to be stressful because dealing with insurance can be stressful. That's a, that's a great thing. And I see you still keep up with uh, so much uh, of the NFL stuff. So you mm-hmm. were, you know, tweeting a little bit about Nick Chubb oh, and that that's... devastating injur- injury that he had. Um, how much, I mean, so football, I mean, even though it kind of had a sad turn mm-hmm. and it's hurtful to see a, a franchise treat you like that and yeah. not like as a human but as a you know very much you're you're just a number on the team right um how does that impact the way that you still watch football enjoy the game i mean tell me a little bit about that yeah i mean f- at least watching oregon football I never had any gripes now i always loved watching oregon football still yeah. do um like even this is oregon See, you got the you got the oregon swag but um the first year watching Lions football was genuinely difficult for me. I'm not going to lie. It was so frustrating because I know like how they treated me, and it was, it was hard to watch. Um, and then last year, it was still – when they lost, I wasn't uh, – when they lost, I was a little bit happy, but also like as long as my friends did well, I was like, all right, yeah. that's awesome. Dan Campbell seems like a pretty good dude. Yeah, and – I mean, we butted heads um, a little bit, but ultimately I do have a lot of respect for them. Um, and so this year it's, I realized I was like, they got rid of a lot of the people that kind of like really did me wrong. And I was like, I can either do one or two things. I can sit there, kind of just have that gripe and just be annoyed every time with them when I see them online or just on TV or I can realize it happened, get over it to myself. Um, I still have tons of friends on that team that, team did truly change my life gave me so many opportunities and just see the positivity even though there's a lot of negativity and just still root for them proudly online and that finally like this year is where I really got comfortable it was like all right I'm still alive I still woke up yeah they did me wrong but who cares I that team gave me so many opportunities in life where I want to see them go be great because honestly the city of Detroit needs a great sports franchise and this team, spe- I think, it can be special and do that. Man, you're such a good dude. I, I really have a, a lot of respect for you, and I I've, that. it's been a, a pleasure having you in here. Um, are you like a fantasy football guy? Do you How do you interact with fantasy football as a former player? I, I love fantasy football, mainly because I'll just like get all my friends or if like – I think our league is like 14 people right now. And is it former players? Is it friends? Who is it a mixture? What's... A little bit of a mixture of like um... – uh, it's honestly mainly friends, but, like, my old college roommates in this league. And for me, it's, like, I will only draft my friends just because it's fun. Uh, but it gets annoying when they draft them and they do really well. I'm like, dang it. He's not even – you don't even know him in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a blast. So I have so much fun with it. Were there a lot of the culture at <clears throat> in the NFL? Are a lot of guys playing fantasy football and stuff like that? Yeah, so, like, even when I was playing, like, I still played. And the rule is it's you can't play more – for more than a hundred dollars and so i was always our commissioner so it's really more so like me finding a reason to kind of like give my friend something stupid it's like i was like first place i'll get you an xbox second place you can just have like the buy or third place was a buy-in which was like five bucks each from everybody um and then second place i can't remember what it was but it was just something random and it was my way of saying like because these are like genuinely like my closest friends so i was like hey I appreciate you guys not changing, like, how you treat me. Because they, they talk so much crap to me constantly. And they, like, they never once changed how they treated me, which I love. Um, you're saying childhood friends who childhood then friends, once you yeah. became an NFL player. So that's who you're mm-hmm. still playing with. But yeah. give us the rules when you're in the NFL. You can't play for over $100. That's yeah. how it works. Yeah. And who were you playing with when you were with the Lions? Same group of people. Same, like, friend group. Same friend group from back yeah. home, yeah. And it's... It's always fun because they always think I'm going to win. I'm like, no, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just clicking on if I see, like, I'll give an example of Dalton Schultz, who's one of my favorite humans ever. Um, really? The, how, do you, how do you know him? We have the he's, same he's agent. The, and then. Uh, okay, he's the tight end for the Texans, Texans yep. right now. And He uh, was in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Uh, him and I, like, did the combine prep together, and we just have a really good friendship. And then him going to Stanford, me going to Oregon. There's always so much trash talk between. Yeah. 
So he's one of your best best friends. Yeah. And so you dra- you wanted to draft him in fantasy football, or you did? This year, I definitely did. Um, I took him fifth, <laughs> uh, fifth round. Fifth but, round. Wow. Um, but last year he was like having a really good year, and one of my buddies took him. I'm like, you don't even know him. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just it's mainly just all for fun. It's I fascinating because just in his case, as looking at the numbers today, mm-hmm. I thought C.J. Stroud would be using a tight end more as a security blanket and getting him a lot of oh, I did looks. But he's not getting as many targets as I thought. Mm-hmm. You know, Which, that surprises me. I mean, they have a good receiving core, but I definitely thought he was going to get a lot more catches and, like, at least the ball thrown at him more because, for the most part, like, he's a very reliable tight end, in my opinion. And yeah. If he gets the ball, he's going to try to run it hard. So, um, I was like, I'm definitely going to take him as my tight end. So, any yeah. other guys, any other tips you can give us for fantasy football players at home? Who else should we be looking at? You're saying you really have no advantages, even being a no. former player. There's zero no. advantages. Because, I mean, end of the day, it's like – so that year, I think when we went, th- we won only three games. We still beat the Patriots. Right. So it's like any given Sunday, someone can go be great. Um, some guys are more consistent at that than others, but I mean, you, ultimately, it is still a toss up on that game day. Last question for you: Best offensive lineman of all time? All time, uh, I'd say Joe Thomas. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I'm going Joe Thomas. Joe was. He's so much fun to watch. He's so athletic and such a blast um, throughout college. That's when I really started like kind of watching NFL guys more. Yeah. Um, and he was someone who I had a blast watching just because he's so physical, so athletic, and he just he played like a jerk. <laughs> um, yeah. Which, as an offensive lineman, you kind of have to. Yeah. A lot of the is there a lot of smack talk there between not so much things we can't repeat. I would say more so. College and NFL because there is like that that respect level in the NFL, but you still get that banter back and forth and it's it's always fun. Yeah, these There's... guys. It's I remember when I was younger, growing up in Philly, um, <laughs> I had the privilege to meet like Trey Thomas and John Runyon a few mm-hmm. times. Oh, that's cool. And those guys were, I mean, amazing. But I mean. They just had a scary quality. They, they're just tough. I mean, <laughs> there's something about. You know, even back then, more like 90s, early 2000s, yeah. football, it was just something weird about these guys. No, like, you don't want to mess breed. with them. Yeah, yeah, those 90s players are they're different. <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy. Um, real quickly, just tell everybody, <coughs> if we want to learn more about Insurance Lounge, how yep. can we find out? I mean, who, who's a great customer for you? Who should be reaching out, and how can we find you online and all that stuff? Yeah, so our website is insurancelounge.com, and then through that website, you, you find the Las Vegas info. Um but, yeah, anyone is honestly a client. Um, if you want to just truly have, like, an empowered feeling about your insurance and understand what you are actually getting. Yeah. Or if you just want the cheapest thing possible, which I don't always recommend because the cheapest thing possible will leave you underinsured in Nevada. Right. Which a lot of drivers in Nevada are underinsured. So if you do get in an accident, you will have to pay a big check still. Um, but just anybody who truly wants – to know what their insurance provides them and someone who doesn't want to deal with calling 1-800 numbers yeah. is our perfect client. I'm gonna do, and so if I give you a call, you can kind of review my auto, my yeah. home, my, like all that kind of different stuff. Yep. And then we can kind of come up with a good game plan. Exactly. Wow. Do you, is there a policy where you can follow me around town and be my personal protection? <laughs> we can think of one. <laughs> okay. That's what I want. <laughs> That's what I want. Listen, I, Tyrell Crosby, I listen, this pleasure. was such a pleasure. This is a, a really, you just seem like a really great dude. I'm really happy you came in here, learned a lot about stuff. I got a lot more emotional than I was thinking I was going to get emotional. <laughs> My today. apologies. But no, I, I love the honesty. That's what the Vegas huddle is all about, guys. It's all about having great conversation with good people who uh, were at the highest of the highest levels of uh, athletic ability and uh, competition and now they're doing amazing stuff in the community so insurance lounge go check them out tyrell crosby i used to live near st rose so, oh, I love, yeah. so it's a great growing area it's awesome. uh good local guy grew up here green valley high school and now he's helping the community that he grew up in thank you so much yeah. tyrell it's great to have you here thank you for in the me. den guys go make sure you listen subscribe uh, we're, wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, and also, of course, on the Silver State Sports and Entertainment Network. Until next time, I'm your host from the Vegas Huddle, Mike Davis. I'll see you next time.